Good evening. Welcome to the March uh, school board meeting. It's a pleasure to have all of you here. Uh, it is our uh, custom to begin uh, with a word of prayer, if you would like to join me. Father, we're grateful for the students here, and we uh, celebrate their accomplishments, uh, many, many hours of hard work, and, uh, and the results uh, have proven that out. So we thank you for them and their dedication. Uh, we pray for the upcoming spring break, for a good break for staff and students, and uh, above all, that uh, our students would learn and grow, and we give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen. So uh, one quick comment about tonight. So we will go through recognition, and then at the end of recognition, um, we will let you know uh, you are will be welcome to stay. It would be great if you did, but if you don't want to stay for the, uh, the exciting part of the business section, uh, it will be a grateful t great time for a graceful exit. Otherwise, please stay, and uh, it will be great. <laughs> Dr. Seed. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Well, uh, tonight we're here to, to celebrate many things. We're going to start off with the swim, both swim teams. Uh, they had an outstanding February, and it started many more months earlier than that. But uh, second and fourth in the state. Congratulations. <laughs> and we had some phenomenal swims. Uh, we're going to meet Jacob here. In the we have a state champ, Jacob Stramp. Congratulations. Uh, and just, uh, it was great. Uh, Carmel, it's going to take a whole lot of energy, a few more guys and ladies to beat them, but uh, we are right there as the best in the state, and so just proud of you and want to say thank you tonight for that. So we'll start with the swim teams. You know, it's a great night when we have to move our meeting into the auditorium to um, have room for everyone that's here to be recognized. So we'll first start with the girls swim team. If you're a member of the girls team, please come up on stage. These are our three-time defending sectional champions. Five-time defending conference champions and three-time defending county champions. The girls team placed fourth at the IHSAA state finals. Franklin scored in every event with seven different athletes go, doing their part in scoring points for the team. We had two freshman athletes join the Franklin Wall of Fame, Cabria Chapman and Gracie Payne. They both had podium finishes in their events. On the season, Franklin broke nine of the school's 11 swim records while also making the first appearance of the top five in school history. First team All-State, like Jesse it. Fraley, Cabria Chapman, Allie Terrell, Gracie Payne, Carla Gildersleeve. Second team, Ella Pfeiffer. Mid-State All-Conference, Jesse Fraley, Cabria Chapman, Allie Terrell, Gracie Payne, Carla Gildersleeve, Ella Pfeiffer, and Sarah Hoffman. State individual finalists, which means they made the top eight, Carla Gildersleeve, Gracie Payne, Cabria Chapman. Huge round of applause for these outstanding athletes. Coach DeWitt, you should come up with him. We'll pass the mic down to each of the students and uh, tell us what event that you uh, swim for us and then if you, uh, your success in the state meet as well, so. My name is Morgan, I am a senior. Normally I swim sprints, but I did not swim in the state meet, but I was a pretty good cheerleader for that, so yeah. <laughs> I'm Alexis Ferguson and usually I swim sprint and I was not at the state. I'm Megan. I usually swim the 500 or 100 fly, but I was not at the state meet. I'm Aaron Clark. Yeah. I usually <laughs> swim 100 back. I too was not swimming at state. Yeah. <laughs> you guys don't have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Lena Caudill. I normally swim the five free and two free, and I was a cheerleader at state as well. Uh -huh. 
I'm Gabriel Chapman, I swim breaststroke, and I finished seventh at state. I'm Sarah, <laughs> hundred and two free, and the two free, I was 16, and the 500, I was 15. I'm Carla Gildersleeve. I swam the 100 fly and the 200 free and got second and fourth and was also in the 200 free relay and the 400 free relay. All right. <laughs> Coach, you want to say anything to recap the season or anything like that? Now's your chance. Um, I don't really want to recap the season. I think you guys did a great job. Um, quite frankly, like this was the best girls team that I've ever had, not in terms of accolades or accomplishments or times or anything like that, but. Um, I didn't have to deal with the lick of drama. We, we didn't have any problems. This was just a wonderful, wonderful group of girls, um, not only to coach, but just to talk to each and every day. So it's been an honor to, to coach them. Congratulations. We're going well, to get one picture here with everybody. We've got to squeeze in. Uh, Mr. Thompson, are you going to get in the picture? Yeah, here we go. All right, thanks everyone, congratulations. Yeah, stay up here please. Next, we'd like to recognize our boys swim team. So if you're a member of that team, please come forward. The boys swim team is a six time defending sectional champion, nine time defending conference champion, and five time defending county champion. So Michael, and the boys swim team is the IHSAA state runner-up. Yep. Our boys team scored points in nearly every event to outpace the field for runner-up with huge nice. swims coming from a pair of seniors and a freshman. Nice. Seniors Michael Kue and Brock Locke will join the Franklin Wall of Fame. On the season, Franklin broke 12 of the school's three swimming and diving records while also winning the runner-up trophy for the first time. First team All-State, Jacob DeStramp, Michael Kue, Brock Locke, Max Kramer, Cade Oliver. Second team All-State, Griffin Edwards. And state finalists reaching the top eight podium, Jacob DeStramp, Michael Kue, Brock Locke, Cade Oliver, and Gage Creech. Also, huge, huge congrats to Coach Zach DeWitt for being this year's Conference Coach of the Year and Indiana State Coach of the Year. Congratulations. We'll do the same thing if you just tell us what you swim on the team and uh, what year you are in school. And if you're a senior, what are your plans for next year? Uh, my name is Brock Locke and I slammed the 100 freestyle at state, and I got sixth place, and I was part of the two free relay and the four free relay, and we got second in that. And I'm a senior, and next year I'm going to Indiana University where I plan to attend the Kelly School of Business. I'm Gage Creech, and I uh, dove at state, and I placed eighth. Uh, I'm Kate Oliver. I swam the 500 and the 200 I am at state. I came uh, eighth in the 200. I am in seventh in the 500. I'm Malachi Henry. I'm a freshman, and I normally swim the 100 backstroke. Uh, I'm Shane O'Sullivan. I'm a junior, and I usually swim the 100 back and the 100 fly. And uh, my name is Max Kramer. I swim the 50 free, the 200 free relay, 400 free relay, and 200 medley relay, which 200 medley relay got fifth, and the 200 free relay and the 400 free relay got state runner-up. My name is Barrett Daly. I'm a freshman here, and I swim the 100 breast. I'm Ethan Pfeiffer. I'm a freshman, and I swim the 100 back and 200 free. Uh, I'm Jacob Des. Ooh. <laughs> I'm Jacob Destramp, and uh, I usually swim whatever do it tells me to do. But <laughs> I, I uh, won the 200 freestyle, got second in the 100 freestyle, and got second in both the relays. All right, we'll squeeze in to get a picture, please.
Get Mr. Thompson to come back. And Mrs. Betts is there in the back. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. We really appreciate, appreciate it. it. Yeah. Well done. Well done. The next athlete we'd like to recognize for being a state qualifier is Tyler Fuquay, who participated in the IHSAA state wrestling tournament. Tyler just missed making the quarterfinal round at the eventual state champion, or to the eventual state champion in the 120 pound weight class. Congratulations, well done. You get to be on the spot, center stage, just like it was at, uh, back at uh, Conseco. Um, so first, want to introduce yourself, to, uh, and then tell us what uh, what year you are in school, and then what are your plans you head for? Because I think people will be excited to hear the things you're going to do, and then also introduce your mom and dad. But don't say that's my mom and that's my dad. <laughs> say okay, thanks. All right, my name is Tyler Fuquay, and I am a freshman. And my parents are Jen Fuquay and Eric Fuquay, and. My plans are really just to get better and hopefully win state one day. Yep. You had a great season. Congratulations. <laughs> Mr. Tull, come here, one picture. One picture. Yeah. So a summer wrestling started already? Yeah. Yep. So no rest for the weary. No. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Congratulations. Franklin was privileged this year to have two Lilly Endowment Scholarship honorees. We'd like to recognize Avery Otten and Brittany Clutchy, who both received the 2018 Lilly Endowment Community Scholarship. This is a full tuition scholarship with a book and equipment stipend for four years at any Indiana public or private college or university. Congratulations to Avery and Brittany. Congratulations, Brittany. Well done. Tell, tell everybody what your future plans are when you graduate. Okay, um, so I will be attending IU to study biotechnology and medical physics, and then after that I plan on going to med school to become a cardiologist. All right, if you'd like to hear more about her story, you can check out our website. I actually interviewed both Avery and Brittany uh, for Superintendent's Corner. They go into more detail about their future plans, but uh, th th not only are they good students, they also had to do community service as part of the Lilly Endowment Scholarship. So they did a lot of work kind of away from school. Uh, so congratulations, a lot of hard work, uh, well deserved. And let's get a picture here. We'll get Mr. Thompson will come in here. All right, congratulations. Next up, we'd like to congratulate and recognize senior Andrew Rose. He was recently selected as a member of the 2017-2018 Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra Side-by-Side -side Program and will perform alongside members of the ISO on March 24th, 21st. Congratulations. Congratulations. Well done. We'll have you introduce your parents and also talk about your future plans. In addition to ISO, he also plays in the New World Symphony, which is another uh, high achieving group in Indianapolis. So congratulations on that as well. All right, so I'm here tonight with my parents, uh, Lori and Eric Rose. And for the future, I'm planning to go to the University of Indianapolis and dual major in both music education as well as performance. Congratulations. We'll get a picture here.
Well done. And Mr. Kosh also, who's here, is the teacher of the students, so congratulations to you as well. This is the second student in a uh, row that Mr. Kosh has had the honor to, to teach and provide tutelage uh, to do a side-by-side -side ISO program, so congratulations to you. Our next student we'd like to recognize tonight is Brian Ross. Brian was selected through a live audition process to perform with the 2018 Indiana Bandmasters Association All-State Honor Ensemble in March at Purdue University. This is Brian's second year being selected to perform with the Honor Ensemble. Well done. Well done. And I think I saw on social media where you earned first chair mm -hmm. for trumpets. Congratulations. Yeah. Right. Uh Introduce uh, uh, anyone that brought you tonight and talk about your future plans. Uh, I'm here with my parent, uh, mom, Karen Ross, and I'm a senior, and after high school, I plan to go to the University of Indianapolis to study trumpet performance. Outstanding. UND is getting a lot of great kids. That's, mm -hmm. that's great. We'll get a picture here. Well done. And lastly tonight, we have our students from Central Nine who have been recognized as Central Nine Students of the Month. For January, we had Abigail Boo, Andrew Finley, Chad Meeks, and Jacob McKinney. And for February, we had Haven Tunin. Come on towards the center of the stage. We're going to do a little question and answer. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what you do at C9 and, and also what you're looking to do as you head into the future, okay? Hi, um, I'm Andrew Finley, and I do HVAC at C9. And I plan to just, after school, get a job straight into HVAC. Hi, I'm Haven Toon, and I do an internship program at U of the Potter. And it's <laughs> and I plan to attend Franklin College and study art education. Hi, um, <clears throat> I'm Jacob McKinney. I do welding at Central 9. Uh, I have an internship at Russell's, and I'm planning on going to Harbor Institute for welding. Congratulations. <laughs> As we look at Andrew's program, it's actually the, the second year for HVAC work uh, through C9, and a lot of these kids are going to come out and uh, have careers that after a few years of up to $60,000. So well done. Congratulations to all of you. Well done. Here, we're going to get one picture here. Did you guys want to introduce your mom and dad and that brought you? My mom is April Phillips. She's over there. My mom is Brenda Finley, and she's over there, and my dad is Jeff Finley. He's over there, too. All right. <laughs> so my mom is Janine McKinney. She's in the back. All right. Each recognition, we do ask all the kids to introduce their parents, because I think uh, the kids get to be out front and be recognized, but it's a lot of behind the scenes, a lot of mom and dad hours. Uh, that contribute to, to this success. So I want to make sure that you uh, get a chance for us to say thank you, and uh, you should feel proud of all of the accomplishments of all the kids that are here tonight. So thank you. And as Mr. Thompson said, this is a great time to exit. If you want to stick around, you're more than welcome. This side has to stay. <laughs>
right, we will continue. Mr. Corliss, is it possible to lower those lights just a little bit? Thank you. We will continue with uh, our agenda. The first item on the agenda is uh, public or board comments uh, relative to any uh, topic on the agenda this evening. If anyone from the uh, audience would like to speak about anything on the audience, please come on up to the podium, state your name and uh, your topic, and please hold your comments to two minutes. Any None appearing, we'll continue to move on. First um, item is the Music Council. Mr. Uh, Thompson, I, I did have one that's item right, if I could insert. We had a, a late addition um, with an on-ball contract. Natalie was kind enough to attach it to the board docket. We've had one on for continuing disclosure through the meeting and I received the other late last week. It's actually for the general obligation bond conversation that we had a week ago. And uh, same, Roger took a look at the continuing disclosure. Same information, a slightly different fee structure. And so I would request your permission to walk that on and approve it with the continuing disclosure contract if we could. I believe for our um, uh, normal course of, of doing business, we need to uh, have a motion to add that to the agenda. We need to add that to the agenda. It's been so moved. Further conversation? And appearing all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Music Council, uh, we did meet last month. Last month. Did we report on it already? We did. We did. Um, you want to talk about the show choir? So, uh, so a couple of items, though. Uh, show choir, uh, both show choirs were uh, successful in making it, making it to the state uh, finals, which will be held on Saturday at Franklin Central. Um, Sensations uh, won their division this past weekend. Uh, Heritage Singers came in third, and um, in the concert choir division, uh, Bella Voce uh, actually beat signature sound in the concert choir division. Um, so uh, they were first and second. I had nine soloists. Uh, I got to hear all nine of them. All nine of them were extremely good. And um, so we have a lot of talent. As you saw tonight with uh, some band uh, folks, we have uh, an equal amount of kids that are very talented in the choir. So uh, well done to our performing arts um, staff. So athletic council. There's no update from last month. Legislative? No update. No update. Superintendent. Oh, yes, I, yes, actually, no. I do have an update. Um, just talked to uh, Representative Young just a few minutes ago. And in the Indiana law, you all know that this year we're required to do background checks for all of our employees. Um, that also includes board members. However, yes. <laughs> uh, you all don't go through a vetting process. You, don't, you get elected. So there was some confusion, and we did, uh, I think, successfully get language inserted in that uh, the board members will still have to do background check, but there's no nothing we can do beyond that. So I want to thank Representative Young and his work uh, to clarify that point of contention, because you know I'm not sure if anything comes back how that plays out, because you're not you are the school employees, but you're your own boss kind of thing. So that's kind of the, the ob obstacle there. So just let the record reflect that. Mr. Thompson is delinquent in his, my apologies, Mrs. <laughs> you, Bright. You were, you were just waiting to see if the law changed, right? I was waiting to see that the law changed. Yeah. So my strategic procrastination, <laughs> it's gonna work. either to that or I forgot. <laughs> we're going to go with that. So. Thank you. Uh, Superintendent Strategic Task Force. Uh, we have a meeting coming up in May, and it'll just be to continue to solidify the uh, Title IV grant for this coming year. Superintendent Strategic Plan. We're going to hear about the plan project tonight. Okay, very good. Communication committee. Um, we talked about what we were going to vote on this evening with that exchange. Okay. Mm -hmm. so. Collective bargaining. No update. No update. Central nine. Um, I, I don't know if Mr. Vaught has been able to attend. He has not been able to attend, but he is scheduled to go in April. Okay. So, yep. Obviously, we had some. Uh, Talented students up uh, this evening from Central Nine. Uh, RDC? No update. No update. All right, very good. All right, we'll move on to consent agenda. It's been moved for approval. It's been moved for approval on a consent agenda. Any uh, 
further conversation? Mr. Thompson, just a quick highlight on uh, letter H, uh, the JOCO agreement. Uh, we're looking forward to that for the second year. And um, we did make a few changes, and that is that uh, we're going to highlight uh, four weeks each semester where we're going down to the middle school to help with that, similar to what uh, Mr. Hart does here at the high school. In addition, uh, we will have training for our staff, again, two days a week. Uh, one day at CBIS, the other day will be at CBS with, with the uh, virtual trainer or someone on site that's writing just the, the, the workouts done. But we want to thank uh, the partnership uh, for John Joko Fitness. Um, it's been very successful. I've talked to Mrs. Terrell. Uh, she had a lot of praise for what's going on, both with the kids in the class as well as after school with our athletes. And in the, in the teacher side, a lot of conversation about liking the class, and we're starting to see more participation. So we're looking forward to another year of that. Just wanted to highlight that. Okay. It's been moved. Any further conversation? Not carrying. All those in favor, signify by the sign of aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Superintendent reports 10X presentations. Mrs. Skeel, please come on up. You want to introduce? Yes. Uh, this... Mrs. Skeel has several members of her class that are going to come up and help uh, share what's going on. Mrs. Skeel is a teacher at Northwood, and, and her uh, 10X grant is highlighting uh, the opportunity to bring back an actual uh, garden to, to attract birds and different things. We're going to hear about that, so we are ready. Who's it gonna, are they going to project? Um, Matt. Or Doug, are we running the projector on this, or does she need to? I have to say, it's on. We were a little disappointed when the crowd left, but we'll put on a good show for you. Um, girls, why you, I'm going to do my part first, so you guys can stand here, face the crowd. <laughs> Parents, you won't be nervous. Before, um, do you want me to use this one? I'm going to use this one. Before I get started, I want to thank Franklin Schools for giving me this opportunity. I want to thank the parents who helped make part of my 10X adventure work, and to Don Owens and Ellen Paris, who are also part of my adventure. Um, my grant starts back with my childhood. My mom always had bird feeders in the backyard, and as kids, we were drug to state parks and hiked and complained the entire time and probably made her life miserable. But it has um, rubbed off on me. My backyard now has bird feeders and any chance I can get, I'm outside. So outdoor education has always been an interest of mine. And so this grant helped me kind of follow some of those dreams I had. I'll try not to get emotional. <laughs> but my grant was Finding Audubon. If you're familiar with John James Audubon, he was one of the first naturalists who painted every species in North America. So I kind of traced some of his steps and, as my family said, embraced my nerdism, which was fine. So we traveled, my family went with me, we used our personal camper and truck and we traveled to these states. In each state, my focus was Audubon centers or national wildlife refuges. And so at these places, I would um, take hikes, I would meet with other bird enthusiasts and learn as much as I could. Um, so I started with the Mary Gray Bird Sanctuary right here in Indiana. And luckily, this was just by luck, the Indianapolis Museum of Art this past summer had an exhibit of Audubon's paintings. So that was like a bonus for me. So I went with a couple friends and we toured that. Um, then our trip was two weeks long. I tried to hit as many Audubon centers along the way. My kids got tired of taking pictures of me in front of signs. <laughs> so these are some of the places I visited. I made sure to um, tour these places, try to find local species. And then on the way home from our trip, I got to stop at John Audubon's home. So that was interesting to kind of learn more about him. I got to see 33 new to me birds on my trip. I did not take these photos. My husband is not very happy with my trip because now I need a camera. I did take the picture of the barred owl. The other ones are just 
photographs I found online, but these are all new to me species. This was my bird nerd glory. Got up early one morning, met these other Audubon members in Maine. It was bright and early. Um, it was a lot of fun. A couple of the ladies were retired teachers, so I think we talked about teaching more than we did the birds. The man in the red, his name's Noah, he claims to have seen the most birds in Maine last year. A large part of our trip was in Acadia National Park. This was just one of the, the hikes that I took. It was just a beautiful path. Um, as fun as my summer adventure was, it was not the best part of my grants. Um, my best part was the Northwood Hiking Club, fall of 2008. Um, I have a few of my friends here. We had 13 members. They affectionately named themselves the Bird Nerds, and we nish, wish now we would have had t-shirts of the Bird Nerds. So I brought my friends with me. They're gonna help explain how the club work, worked and some of the things that we did. And we've, we've had a few members that couldn't make it, so we have to adjust very quickly on who's gonna speak. You're first, okay. We have two people who aren't here, um, Aristotle and Bryson. My name is Emily McCurry. And my name is Willa Thomas. And on the first day, we got our guides, journals, and binoculars. A pair of binoculars. Will is holding one of the bird guides that we used so the kids could record what we saw on our hikes. Emily has one of the guides to help us identify. And then Franklin Schools was kind enough to give us all a bag to carry our goodies in. And we traveled to our hikes on a, a Franklin Schools passenger van. Mrs. Paris and I were both approved to drive them. That was kind of the fun part too. <laughs> Now we're talking about Blue Heron Park. We hiked through the woods and saw nuthatches, and then we went to an open field and saw some goldfinches and heard cicadas. We also saw frogs and crickets. I joined because I'd like to go on a quiet hike, and I like to get my exercise in fresh air, and I know it's peaceful. I joined because I love nature and animals, and I wanted to get some exercise and um, wanted to get out and see the beautiful wilderness. <laughs> My name is Isabel Gentry and this I'm talking about FCHS and we saw a lot of goldfinches it was really hot that day and we found a pond full of water ducks mm -hmm. did you know there's a pond on the high school property it's hard to see we took the big trail that went part of the nature walk and like walked back through the grass and found the pond and so found some ducks and it was super hot you were right but Isabella was a trooper. She was riding ahead of the rest of us as we're like dying of heat exhaustion. Hi, my name is Sarah and I am joining Providence Park. We saw a lot of cardinals and there was something funny that happened. A branch almost fell on his skill. We saw lots of fish in, in the creek, and it was just a lot of fun. And I joined hiking club because I grew up around nature and in the wilderness, and ever since then I've loved uh, nature. So. This was probably my favorite hike. It was just this beautiful fall day. We kind of had the park to ourselves. And if you can see the two girls, a couple other members, sitting at the table, they sat there for like 30 minutes. And it was like one of those perfect teaching moments because they were so involved, so active. So it was one of those perfect days, I thought.
My name is Abby, and I'm doing the last day. We looked at some pictures of the Audubon painting, and we did. Uh, we went on to the Audubon's website. We made bird feeders out of milk jugs, and I joined the hiking club because I like looking at different types of birds and hiking. Well done, girls. Good job. I know you were nervous. You were troopers. We actually, um, the hiking club still has one more hike we're taking this year. We, due to some uncontrollable circumstances, we could not take our mystery hike, which the girls still don't know about. So um, on Monday in April, we are going to go on our final hike. It's, it's a mystery. We can't tell you. <laughs> so we're hoping to add to our journals. But overall, it was a great time. I plan on doing this every fall, this club, because I have a lot of supplies, and it was so much fun. So thank you for letting us come and share our adventures. Do you want to introduce your parents? You can do My mom's Kathy Thomas. She's over there. <laughs> My mom is here with me, and her name is Stephanie McCrary. Thank you. Uh, moving on, Title One overview, overview. Mrs. Brown now. I'm actually going to do. Project Lead the Way, because that's the order of my slides. That's okay. Sure. So, first up. I'm really excited to share two new um, curriculum and instruction adventures with you guys tonight. I've been writing about them in Friday notes, but um, we're getting closer and closer to fruition and getting really excited about the implementation of both of these. First is the Project Lead the Way. Um, and last week or last month, we talked about receiving the e-learning grant from the Department of Education to help jumpstart this program. I just wanted to share with you a little bit about what that would look like. For the elementaries, we are in the process, our elementary principals are in the process of hiring um, highly qualified, what are we calling them, instruction, no, um, project lead the way assistance, technology assistance, I think is where we finally landed. And they will be part of the specials rotation, so students will have music, art, PE, and STEM. And just to give you a little bit of an idea of what those modules will look like at the different grade levels, for kindergarten, we have selected pushes and pulls, animals and algorithms, first grade light and sound and animated storytelling. For second grade, the changing earth and grids and games. Third grade, stability in motion, which is science of flight and variation of traits. Fourth grade, input output, input output with computer systems and input output with the human brain. So all of our students, kindergarten through fourth, or through fourth grade, will have some exposure to science, technology, engineering, and math prior to heading into the intermediate school. Um, we are still working uh, at the intermediate and middle school levels um, to define what that program is going to look like, but we did get funding to purchase some of the equipment that we would need. Uh, possible modules could include automation and robotics, design and modeling, computer science, innovators and makers, app creators, or the science of technology. And then at the high school level, we are definitely implementing, as part of Project Lead the Way, the principles of biomedical sciences next year. And I talked to the teacher, do you remember how many, Steve, how many students? I think he has 64 students um, already scheduled for that class for next year. So that's very exciting. In addition, we've already added it. Um, it's not part of Project Lead the Way, but it is part of the STEM initiative as the AP Computer Science class of the high school as well. Any questions about Project Lead the Way? It's going to be big fun. Okay, Ms. Road News. I've asked Denise to come up and present, <clears throat> help present this next section with me. 
um, because we've worked really closely on it together and she's actually taken some key leadership roles with parts of this. So why are we gonna do something different with Title I funding? Um, Lots of reasons. We've talked a lot over the years how, how our Title I funding has dwindled. I think from three years ago, it was over 800,000 to this year being just barely 500,000. So we need to look at how we are gonna use that fund, use those funds to get the, the most bang for our buck. Currently, all the money goes to just four elementary schools and we pour everything into literacy and literacy improvement mostly at the younger grades. Um, but when we look at, started to look at the data, we noticed that we weren't able to maintain some of those gaps that we were closing in kindergarten through second grade primarily. And if you looked, I don't know if I can, this will pull up. Oh, it does. Um, this is a quartile chart, the top, our third grade reading scores, and it shows the bottom 25%, middle 75th percent, all the way to the 100th. Just pay attention to the colors there because the bottom chart is eighth grade reading scores. And this is over um, a 10 year period. And you can see that our colors don't change a whole lot between our third grade reading scores and our eighth grade reading scores. So we decided we needed to try a different model that would allow us to put resources into all of our buildings and um, help all of our kids grow and sustain the growth that they were seeing in, in grades K through two. So a couple other talking points here. Um, you know, you guys know we've gone from three instructional coaches down to one. And she's fabulous, but she can't be everywhere all the time. Um, we have seen an increased workload for our principals through managing student behaviors, through the demands of our evaluation system, um, leaving very little time for facilitative instructional growth. Um, when they have a chance to get into the classroom, it's usually evaluative. And so there's not a lot of time for that, um, that work that they would love to do, but the demands of the job just don't um, allow them to be able to get in there and really work with teachers on improving other than through that evaluation process. So improving education for our students includes opportunities for our teachers to grow and provide the best instruction every day in every class for every student. And that's really where we're trying to head with this instructional coach model. Um, and then just this last bullet, if we don't provide teachers with, with new tools, we'll continue to build the same structure. And we saw just a few minutes ago that that structure was not, it was stagnant. It's not changing, it's not growing, and we, we need to work to close those achievement gaps. So our problem statement as we work through this process ends up being student growth and achievement is our ultimate guiding principle. Improving education for students includes opportunities for teachers to develop best practices for rigorous, relevant, and engaging instruction. Modeling, coaching, and timely feedback, that's the most important part in my opinion, are paramount for teacher instructional growth. By the beginning of the 2018 school year, all eight schools will have an instructional coach focusing on learning strategies, helping teachers and students reach their fullest potential as evidenced by our success metrics. And I'm gonna turn this over to Denise, so she's gonna talk about what our timeline is like. Well, first of all, I just have to say, I'm extremely excited about this new venture, um, to have a, a coach in each building to support our teachers, which will directly impact student growth. That's, that's been a talk with Dave and Deb um, all along in this journey. Um, our project track, uh, tracker, we've just been keeping track of all of, all of our meetings and, and everything that we're doing. And the first thing before we even rolled out any of this information was to make sure that we, they, we spoke to our Title I teachers because they were directly impacted. Um, I, from the bottom of my heart, um, I felt um, that that was just the best decision for these two leaders to make. And I was very thankful and grateful for that um, because they needed to let them know 
how, how, um, how much they appreciated all that they have done for our kids. And it had nothing to do with their current services. They were doing a phenomenal job. Just with the, the data that Deb has shown you, we just could not continue with this model. So anyway, that was one of the, probably the biggest meetings that we had. And then um, Dave sent out a letter to um, all our staff, letting them know what was going on. And I'm telling you what, buzz, the buzz was it. I mean, it was going on in the schools. Everybody was asking what's going on. I personally was contacted by many of our teachers just to ask what was, this, what was gonna happen. And I was very frank um, about everything that was gonna happen. Um, we now, if you'll notice, I do not have a check on the interview start, but there'll be a check there tomorrow. They started today. We had three phenomenal interviews and they'll continue the rest of this week. And then the, the beautiful thing about this is that at the end, in the summer, um, all coaches, all building principals, Dave, Deb, and myself, will be attending an Institute for Instructional um, Center in Lawrence, Kansas. And we'll be all together for a full week to make sure that we figure out exactly what it is that we need to do for this coaching model. Because I have to say, I've done the best I could, but I'm excited to have this new venture. So that was our timeline. Any questions about it? Did you want to say something? Just say, part, sure, of, sure. part of the timeline, we didn't create a picture because it's, it's ugly, is the <laughs> FMEA that Jeff led Denise and I through where we really took a hard look at all the different things that could go wrong um, with this model and tried to address those in our implementation and timeline so that we could you know, head those off before they became a reality. And I think we've done a really good job at that. It helped us with our communication plan. Um, it helped us with trying to spread the word and communicate with teachers, uh, the public. Um, just a, it's, it was just helpful to do that up front. I know, Darren, I know you're saying, told you so. <laughs> I would never say that to you, Deb. You what? I would never say that to you. <laughs> I just know you like those things. <laughs> it's okay, I gotta tell you quick. Okay. okay, thank you, sorry about that. Okay, in, in our success metrics, there were two uh, building our guiding principles that we knew we had to make sure and address. Um, and that was a systemic continuous improvement, having our coaches work with our teachers and principals um, for stu individual student growth. That is, is, is our first thing that we're gonna be addressing. And, our indi and the first line there, it says instructional coaches partner with teachers. I took that straight from Jim Knight's The Impact Cycle. That's who we're gonna go see uh, this summer at Kansas. And one of the indicators of success for that, we have to have feedback from the teachers and the instructional coaches and our ad administrators. We're gonna uh, gather all of that to determine our next steps. And then um, we wanna, we know that there's gonna be an upsurge in the implementation of practices or great instruction. Our coaches are gonna be working alongside all of our teachers to ensure that that, that is happening. We know if that happens, the indicators of success is that we're gonna have proficiency um, with all of our staff in um, being instrumental in uh, utilizing all the great instruction. So we're gonna devise a rubric just to check through that, to do that. So that's our first um, guiding principles, make sure that we have systemic continuous improvement with our teachers. And this is where we're really going, individual student growth. That's it, pure and simple. And so we know that students that are engaged in our great instruction will lead to academic growth. Our indicators of success, I already have all kinds of data from the last few years, but we'll for sure take 2018 to spring and then measure it with 19 and then the subsequent years. Um, and uh, another thing our coaches are gonna have, we're gonna have continuing conversation with increasing um, our time spent reading, writing, and discussing content-rich text and we're gonna measure that with some end of the year observations and interviews and, and surveys. So those are our success matrix. Any questions about our journey? Okay. I would just like to say um, we've had 14 teachers apply for six positions. Really excited at the quality. I know one of the concerns from our, the, the field of teachers was um, that they we were just gonna fill positions, and that is not true. We, we, we are looking for the superstars that are, are truly committed um, and have a keen understanding 
of the instructional process, and I'm confident we are going to have six of the very best um, working alongside our teachers every day next year. It's so exciting. I do have one one question. So you're going to hire one coach per school, um, and so at some of the schools where the numbers of teachers are large, uh, that means they're spread very, very thin. Um, have, during the course of your conversations, have you g given much thought as to, so these are full-time coaches, this is what they do. Ha has there been any conversations about how you leverage those coaches to have other coaches who are still doing their normal thing of teaching uh, to, to be able to leverage um, better than what you're able to with, of course, it's eight's better than one, right? <laughs> so the theory True. would go. So I, I, I don't know if I'm articulating my question well enough. Yes, but we have had those conversations. Okay. So yeah. um, Denise is actually, Denise is going to kind of be the lead coach and will work alongside the coaches. And she will also be the, the person at Union. So Union will not have a full-time coach. Um, the other schools will. At the high school, we're still str struggling to figure out what that looks like. It might be a, more of a technology integration coach. It might be where we're pulling um, two or three different teachers from a couple periods throughout the day to serve as coach. Uh, funds are limited still. So right now, for this year, we can only go with the eight that we have. Um, but if, I think if we find, at least in my mind, if we find this is a really successful model, that might be something we take a look at as an admin team to determine if we can add more to, to leverage out the, the larger schools. I know at the high school, I've been in conversation with uh, Ms. Rahouse and Mrs. Maddox. Uh, they are look, They do have a, a couple of teachers that did not want to come out of the classroom, but did say they will help in coaching uh, at any time. So that's how we're going to maximize numbers at the high school and look at that. So that, that is one place. Obviously, their numbers and unions are different, and with the FTE counts, we'll continue to look at that. So I know that they are looking at, and I've had a conversation specifically about that uh, at this building. One of the things we'll be asking our uh, principals to do this summer is to write school improvement goals around our instructional model. So they'll work closely with the coach to determine what the goals look like in each building and I anticipate those looking a little different. One school may really need to focus in on learning objectives and another school may want to focus in on formative assessment piece. Um, so depending on their goals will kind of depend on how they operate throughout the year. Denise will always be available to go help to if, if there's a, uh, something that Rita or Dave want to do at the larger schools, we'll be able to go and help a coach out, maybe introduce a new um, structure or a new format or, I don't know, anything new. We can do whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. But those, those conversations, we've had those too because we understand that not each school has the same staff, so um, those are things we're, we're working through as well and have thought through. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No. Thank you, ladies. Mr. Mercer, employer of choice. Good evening. I'm going to ask uh, three individuals to join me on stage. Jeff Sewell, Michelle Bright, Chris Bratcher, who were our subcommittee chairs throughout this process. I might mention, too, Deb and Denise, Dr. Clendenning, done a really nice job on the instructional coaches. I'm looking forward to that. For the finance guy to say that, I guess that's a lot. Um, they've really been good. The employer of choice is something that really uh, began many, many years ago. And Darren, I'm going to pick on you for a second because you said it first. And that was, what would it look like if we were truly the employer of choice, we were the provider of choice? And we talked about that for a number of years. And I do appreciate the board and Dr. Clendenning allowing us to push this one forward. We coined this owning great because really when you get right down to it, it's everybody here owning us being great. And uh, the three folks and the other eight that walked alongside us 
really did a great job of helping us push that forward. So many thanks to all of them, and I'll highlight them as we, as we go. Here's what I'm gonna to share tonight. I'm gonna to examine quickly the why of Employer Choice Project. I'm gonna outline the foundational pieces that we put together, vision, mission, absolutes, deliverables. I'm gonna, uh, actually I'm not going to, they're going to summarize the subcommittee core tenants, indicators, success, talk a little bit about success metrics, and then we're gonna talk quickly about next steps and control strategy. I might mention too, by the way, and I'm gonna embarrass her when I do this, Michelle Bright has the Eagles tickets concert tonight at eight o'clock. And so for her to be here, I just want to go on record as saying thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And we're into the countdown here, so I'll go rapidly. Okay. Yeah, four seats, yeah. Why become the employer of choice? Well, there's a litany of reasons why you might want to do that, but here are some that we've talked about and have chosen. Number one, choosing to work and choosing to stay in Franklin. We hope that the, the, the concept of being an em employee in Franklin schools, be it a teacher, administrator, support staff, whatever it might be, is something that you enjoy coming to every day. And uh, we knew with the circuit breaker impact, we've lost $22 million over a span of eight years, that we had to do things a little bit unique and different in order to make that a reality. While we take a million three out of our general fund every year to make things work, others don't have to do that, certainly nearly as much. And um, we've worked very hard to create some innovations dollars and to do things like this to help us make Franklin, a place you'd want to choose to work and choose to stay. We hope that a byproduct will be reduced turnover. We've done some uh, data analytics around that. We've just started. We've got a lot more work to do, uh, but we hope that some of the outcomes will be around reduced turnover. We want to replenish with outstanding employees. So as we have a solid recruiting strategy, when folks do leave, uh, we replace them with great people. Less stress and more fun. It's not fun to be stressed out when you come to work. Nobody likes to do that. We all realize that work is hard and some days are better than others, but we do want it to be fun and we work very hard. You've seen the wellness piece rolled out in the last year and, and some others that are forthcoming. We want it to be an exciting environment, a place that you want to be and that you want to work. Here was our deliverable to you, and I've said this to you many, many times. Darren and Andy walked alongside us and provided great support and help, but bottom line was by this evening, the Owning Great team will provide to the Board of School Trustees a tangible vision aimed at executing the strategy for attracting, optimizing, and retaining outstanding employees as evidenced by a formal written plan including the various core tenets of our desired organizational culture. I might mention that this plan was uh, delivered to, to Dr. Clendenning last week. I know he's had an opportunity to start through it. We'll continue to work on this tonight. It's more of an informational piece for you, but as we lock in on those recommendations that he selects, uh, we will certainly do that. One of the things we did early on was to uh, conduct a baseline job satisfaction survey of our employees, and you probably are aware, we have at or about 600 employees. Of that, well over 400 participated in the survey. We'll use that survey each and every year to help us uh, track our success, and some of the success metrics from each of these committees are really aimed at improving those scores each and every year. This is our timeline, culminating with the last box being tonight on March the 12th board presentation. We have some work to do beyond this, but really our goal was to get to this evening and present that for you. Here's the vision that was created collaboratively by all of the uh, members of the subcommittees and full committee. Franklin Community Schools desires to cultivate a culture of excellence where people want to work, own great, serve as outstanding employees and have long lasting careers while influenced by the entire work experience. And we've become very cognizant of the entire work experience, especially in the last couple of years as we talk about wellness and social and emotional and, and uh, physical uh, workspaces and things of that nature, all the things that we've worked about uh, and talked on over the last couple of years. We created a series of mission absolutes. These are the things that we tried to adhere to as we did our work over the course of six months. Uh, one was to create a compelling vision that's well communicated and understood. We have uh, shared this information with uh, our entire staff as we've gone. I sent out survey results to all of them. We'll send out additional information as we go. Create a clear purpose and meaning uh, so that our work's meaningful, significant, and purpose-based. We want to make sure that, that everyone in our corporation has a mastery of roles and that we focus on high performers. We want a highly collaborative environment. That's one of our guiding principles. Dr. Clendenning talks about it all the time. We want that to be the case. And the things that we create, we want to make sure uh, they supplement that highly collaborative environment. 
create a pioneer mentality. We're creating something that isn't business as usual. We've done a lot of that. In fact, I'd probably stack us up with just about anyone between our 10X grants and a variety of the other things that we've done here. Uh, we do that, and we need to continue to do that. It's, it creates uh, energy and excitement. The will to create a culture of excellence. This is hard work. Uh, if this was easy, everybody would be doing it, and you'd heard about it uh, a lot more in the school setting than you did in Franklin. It would have been easier, frankly, not to do this at all, uh, because when you put yourself out there, then you're, uh, you're required to, to uh, measure up to it. Uh, we wanted to create a culture where crucial conversations are acceptable and expected. When you hear about uh, evaluations, those are the kinds of things that we're talking about there. And then finally, our developed strategy has an expectation of sustainability. If we don't intend to sustain it, there's no point in doing it, and we don't want, we don't want in any way to waste anyone's time. So we've got strategies in place for sustaining that, and I'll mention it in a moment. Here's our three subcommittees. Michelle chaired the Culture of Competitive Wages and Benefits, along with Tammy Jackson, Tony Harris, Paula Fleener. I would mention to you, by the way, that each group had equal representation. There were teachers, administrators, support staff. Uh, they all did a great job. Second group was chaired by Carissa Bratcher, Culture of Personal and Professional Development. Denise Rodenhus did double duty. Laura Maddox was on that committee as well. And then finally, uh, Culture of Performance and Recognition. Uh, Jeff stepped up, uh, thankfully, and we appreciate that. Uh, Kia Depi departed a month or so ago, and Jeff picked up the ball and ran. Ben Carroll and Robin Betts were also on that committee. So at this point, I'm going to turn over and ask these folks to tell you just a little bit about their um, each subcommittee, Culture of Competitive Wages and Benefits, is Michelle Bright. Michelle. Hi, thank you. Um, so just quickly um, reading over the slide, um, again, the Culture of Competitive Wages and Benefits was uh, myself and Human Resources, Tony Harris representing uh, certified staff, Tammy Jackson in the business office as deputy treasurer, and Paula Fleener in food services. Our core tenant ended up being in order to become the destination corporation by attracting, optimizing, and retaining outstanding employees in the current economic client, climate, we must offer competitive wages and benefits by creating a robust and dynamic compensation and benefit strategy. Our indicators of success, compensation and benefits packages are plus or minus 5% of our peer groups for both certified and classified staff and are assessed on a three-year cycle. Budget allocation supports proximity to the industry standards for teachers and support staff. A decrease in staff turnover and attrition from the baseline and an increase in length of tenure from the baseline. Which led to our success metrics being compensation and benefits packages are within an acceptable range as compared to our peer group and a decrease in staff turnover and attrition and an increase in length of tenure. Um, just a little bit of background on the how we got to where we ended up. We did um, a lot of research actually on not only using the um, employee uh, engagement survey, we actually reached out to um, school districts in our area as well as local businesses. Um, we've always focused on um, other school districts as being as our competitors and of course they are for our certified staff and some of our um, classified staff as well, but we really felt as though there were some local businesses and um, other organizations within the area where we have an opportunity to not only attract talent, but also um, that's where some of our folks are leaving us to go. So we talked to them a little bit too, and we reached out and we talked to them about their pay rates and um, their benefit packages and just kind of their starting pay, their median pay, those kinds of things. Um, in regards to our school corporations, we did talk to a unique, interesting, new peer group. Um, we used the peer group a little bit that we had used in the past that are um, resourced a little bit like us, but really we looked at schools within our county and also schools within a reasonable distance that we felt would be competitors. So um, where are our teachers going, where are they coming from, that kind of thing. Um, we did learn that um, based on raw data that uh, we are probably within plus or minus 6% of most of our county schools. Um, three of five of them do have starting wages a little bit higher than us, but nine of the 12 schools that we looked at outside of the county are paying higher wages um, by greater than 5%. So just kind of interesting data. Um, starting wages for nearly all classifications of support staff is lower than basically the entire peer group that we looked at. Um, the good news that we saw from all that research was that our comprehensive benefits package really are very competitive. 
Um, the survey showed people didn't really feel that way, and I think that there's some education that we can do there. Um, local businesses, again, starting wages for the support, tap, support, mm -hmm, support staff types of positions um, are lower than some of our local businesses, too. So just some additional research looking there. The employee engagement survey results, overall, very positive. We didn't identify some areas that we feel um, maybe need some further exploration. Um, it was interesting, we asked our employees to rate their top five benefits, so the most important things to them, and our certified staff listed their turf benefit, so their teacher retirement fund, as number six. So one through five was, I believe, benefits, um, sick days, personal days, uh, their 403B, and also year-round paychecks. So we thought that was just kind of an interesting um, dynamic there. The survey also indicated that employees have a perception that our wages and benefits are lacking, and I don't know that that's necessarily the case, so just some education. So, to sum it up, um, a few areas of concern. We believe that there is a possible lack of understanding and knowledge amongst all of our staff regarding benefits, including the options, the cost, how the corporation contributes, and general information on how to be more actively engaged in their health care. We believe that the Human Resources Department may be in a good position to develop and maintain a comprehensive education and training program for employees and supervisors to continue to arm our employees with as much information as possible. We also believe, based on survey data, there may be an opportunity for increased education about retirement options, including TERF and PERF. Um, there may be some concern regarding the current pay rates for our classified staff members, which may lead to a subcommittee to conduct a more in-depth wage analysis with very broad information that we gathered. And lastly, staff turnover and attention um, may be directly affected by the benefits and compensation, and um, thus we are going to establish hopefully some baselines um, to be able to use looking forward to see kind of how we do moving forward. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. One of the things I wanted to mention too, and I neglected to a moment ago, the average score on a five-point Likert scale on the job satisfaction survey was 3.74. The area that we scored the lowest in were the wages and benefits, which didn't totally surprise me. Um, but as Michelle pointed out, certainly a number of areas for us to continue to look. Second subcommittee was culture, personal and professional development, Carissa Bradshaw. I had um, the privilege to work with Laura Maddox, who's the assistant principal here at the high school, and Denise Rodenhuis, um, one of our instructional coaches. And we were tasked with developing the FCS culture of personal and professional development, which we defined um, as FCS culture of personal and professional development embraces the heart and soul of its employees by encouraging risk taking and inspi inspiring a pioneer mentality while recognizing when goals are achieved and victories are won. With that, we defined indicators of success um, as collaborative thinking occurs amongst staff members after attending professional and personal development, modeling lifelong learning and impacting student success. Individual student growth inspires a pioneer mentality of innovative thinking that enables FCS to be the provider of choice and trust is established when employees feel valued and appreciated. Building on those, we defined our success metrics as collaboration builds confidence in employees to reach their full potential, share ideas, and seek out more opportunities for growth resulting in student success. The desire to enhance individual student growth will drive employees to seek out personal and professional development opportunities, and trust will be evident based on employee retention and a positive culture. Um, obviously, student success and individual student growth was something that we um, felt strongly about and wanted to make sure that all of our goals were tied back to. Our committee used a variety of data points. Um, we used the FCS satisfaction survey, which like Jeff said, was completed by 463 employees. We also used articles and research from SHRM, which is the Society for Human Resource Management, and other education-based publications like School Business Affairs. Our survey showed that 78% of our employees agreed that they were encouraged to do their best. Our committee really wanted to focus on how we could help them reach their full potential. Based on our results, there was a little bit of a concern um, relative to collaboration in our support staff. 
when you looked at the two classifications separately, 87% of our certified staff agree that FCS encourages a collaborative culture, but only 61.4% of our classified staff agreed to that same statement. So one thing that we might consider would be adding a PLC type situation or focus groups for our support staff to change that number. 62.4% um, of our employees feel like FCS allows them opportunities to pursue professional development. Um, there was a survey in 2017 done by Gallup that says 87% of millennials will base their job decision on whether or not they're going to accept a position on what opportunities you can provide to them. So with that information, we really wanted to look at um, PD opportunities and how they correlate to retention and recruitment. And um, that's where we felt like we should focus. And we also felt like that was an area where we could recognize where FCS is doing really well. One of the unique opportunities that we have is the 10X grant. The, the 10X grants not only act as a valuable recruitment tool, but it also aids in employee retention. 71% um, of our employees agreed that FCS encourages new ideas and innovation, and we believe that the 10X grants played a part in that score. One employee stated on the survey, I do so appreciate the 10X grants. I think this is a great way to reward employees for their hard work. What an exciting and encouraging opportunity for staff. I have seen it spark enthusiasm. So I definitely think that is um, something that we have that, that's going great um, and something that we would hope we could continue in the future. Um, I also want to thank Mr. Mercer for the opportunity to participate in such an important project and something so enriching for our employees. I would also like to thank Dr. Clendenning and the board for their support. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And as you might have noticed too on the success metrics, we haven't listed items specifically. Um, Dr. Clendenning has those recommendations and as soon as he moves through those and uh, we work through it, we'll lock in on some specific numbers. Uh, last but certainly not least, Jeff Sewell, uh, who led the culture of performance and recognition here over the last months, done a great job as always of kind of guiding us through, especially since he had to kind of pinch hit. So Jeff. Thank you. So we uh, were tasked with looking at our uh, performance evaluation processes and our recognition processes and we developed the core tenet of a culture that fosters high performance where collaboration, trust and achievement is valued and recognized. This includes timely acknowledgement of outstanding performance, initiative and achievement in order to stimulate and sustain high levels of productivity and satisfaction. So. Um, in our indicators of success, we uh, decided we wanted to align those things with our corporation's guiding principles. We wanted to measure performance with realistic and challenging standards. We wanted to recognize and celebrate the passion and innovation of our employees and our achievements. And then we wanted to provide accountability and coaching through our evaluation processes. Uh, so we, uh, I, I won't read all of this to you, but we, essentially what we did in the process is we looked at all our evaluation tools and our evaluation processes and kind of evaluated those against our indicators of success. And uh, we also looked at the uh, performance evaluation or the, um, the employee engagement survey and looked at those results and felt like uh, for the most part, uh, both of those things are, are trending in a, in a strong direction for the corporation. Uh, we did identify a number of areas and recommendations where we can make improvements in the evaluation tools and we think there's always room uh, to uh, celebrate our achievements and, uh, and, and highlight those things that we're accomplishing. Um, I think the, uh, the main takeaway though is again that we're, we're in good shape with, with those processes and uh, feel like uh, just some of the uh, recommendations with uh, some changes to the, the evaluation process for the certified staff uh, we do want to uh, re retool the non-certified staff evaluation to uh, make it more specific to the job category. It's currently they're all evaluated against the same set of factors. And uh, then on the uh, recognition front, uh, we're looking at a, a resource to kind of help uh, energize our recognition efforts uh, down at the uh, kind of the section level or the group 
uh, department level. So those were the main takeaways and uh, uh, I'm glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Jeff. We asked one question on the survey where we said, list three words to describe Franklin Community Schools. The larger the word, the more often it appeared. And um, I think it's just to echo what Jeff said, really the results were pretty positive. Um, uh, not that we can't improve and we certainly want to do that, but it really came across pretty well. Here's the next steps. Uh, following Dr. Clendenning's review of the project and responding to any additional questions he may have, We'll set about taking the necessary action steps to move this project forward. I will clearly keep you abreast of what's going on as we go. Uh, there's likely going to be a handful of additional committees created to work on specific items. Jeff alluded to one of those, which was classified staff evaluation document. Currently, the document is exactly the same for every non-certified employee. Clearly, bus drivers are very different than custodians who are very different than food service. We think that probably there's some core um, areas that we would keep, but we would customize it out. So we need to uh, convene a group of those folks and allow them to do that. We'll be working through that strategy. A control plan is already in process and will be finalized once final recommendations are identified. Uh, so we'll move forward with that and make sure that everybody understands where we're headed. Uh, as part of the control plan, uh, we, we do intend to do an annual job satisfaction survey to measure our results one year to the next. And then finally, uh, we need to finalize a sustainability strategy with assigned leadership and team members to push the project forward from year to year. Um, it's pointless, as I mentioned before, to do this if we're not gonna sustain it. I have volunteered to serve in that role uh, to allow us to continue to move it forward so that somebody owns it and we can um, move along with the things that we decide we need to uh, push forward. So providing the board and or Dr. Clinton thinks that I am an effective um, uh, assignee to that, I'm happy to take that and we have some ideas for how that might work and uh, we'll push those forward as we can. So very quickly, that's six months worth of work wrapped into 20 minutes. And uh, I, again, I appreciate all the committee members giving up their time uh, to work on this project and we would be happy to entertain any questions now or if you have questions in the future, certainly don't hesitate to ask. I'd, I'd just like to say, uh, not, not a question, but just to say thanks for um, to the leadership staff, to to each team, uh, for uh, taking hold of uh, you know a, a a comment that that we started with ten years ago or so, and and knowing that we were facing a a financial challenge and uh, rising up to that challenge at the same time becoming a great culture and a great organization and. I really ap applaud you for tackling some very challenging topics and um, working through those uh, uh, those subjects. And we're in a, an extremely competitive landscape, and it's only going to get more challenging as the the, the challenge for. Uh, younger teachers is, is going to get greater as fewer and fewer folks appear to be going into your profession. So uh, just a, a really heartfelt thanks for tackling uh, a, a topic that that uh, I felt strongly about 10 years ago, feel strongly about today in terms of this corporation and this community being the best kept secret in the, uh, in the state of Indiana. And I, um, our secret is not much of a secret anymore. So. Uh, well done to uh, uh, the leadership staff, to this team, uh, both for this and for the other topics that we heard of Project Lead the Way, instructional coaches. Uh, we're doing some really good stuff in light of the fact that we still have uh, a bit of a financial burden. And I think we've proven that uh, w even with a burning platform, uh, we can become better at what we do. And so uh, hats off, thank you very much. Thank you, it's our pleasure. Well done, well done. All right, we will move on to action items. Ms. Corley, Michelle, would you like us to sing an Eagles song well, since so you didn't uh, get the- Mr. Corliss, can you queue up, queue up a little Desperado uh, for you're us? You're still going? Mr. Bright, thank you for, hurry up there. 
little Bye. Hotel California. It's a lovely place. You can check out any time you'd like. <laughs> but you can never leave, just like here. <laughs> Dr. Clinton, you want anything open? Uh, I'll, I'll do it from here, and that'll be great. Thank you. All right, so uh, first item, uh, thought exchange service agreement. Yes, over the, the last several months, we've been talking about how do we engage uh, a variety of stakeholders. And actually, you heard three different examples of engagement tonight. We had Mrs. Roden, who's talking about monitoring feedback on the coaches uh, from the teachers, the internal stakeholder group. Um, you heard Mr. Mercer talk about sending out the survey to internal stakeholder groups and receiving information back uh, in terms of employability uh, survey. And then in addition, we've talked about Project Lead Way and its success matrix. So we went on a journey to find uh, a partner that would help us with that. And so with Mrs. Ott and the Communications Committee, uh, we looked at a variety of, of different uh, opportunities to engage our community. We, come up, we came up with a Thought Exchange uh, after interviewing a couple of other um, companies and looking at, at different things. I will tell you that this one is going to provide us with an opportunity to do a variety of two-way conversations. And probably the best part is the analytical power behind it uh, is going to be provided by this company. We won't have to do a lot of the the extra work, um, they'll provide it. Well, they'll provide a website that we'll click to and we'll be able to move forward. Uh, so next year's uh, conversation with uh, our employees will be done by Thought Exchange. Same questions, we'll get a, a question. One of the things that comes up a lot, especially like in my 360, well, is it really anonymous? Or is he gonna know that I said this? Well, through this type of resource, we'll have anonymity, but we'll also be able to drive home uh, everything that, that we need. So with that, uh, we previewed it last at the work session, talking about strategic planning with us. And tonight we're here asking for uh, your approval uh, for engagement with Thought Exchange. I'll move to approve, please. Okay, I'll move to approve for your discussion. No appearing. All those in favor signify by sign of aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And Mr. Young did read the service agreement to, uh, so that we were all on the same. We did actually change some of the language to reflect our needs and not the company's needs. So thank you. Uh, on ball contract, I do believe, uh, Jeff, that the uh, uh, agenda is written appropriately with the, the, the late carry-in item, that the agenda did reflect the item that you wanted to discuss, correct? That is correct. Okay. So okay. So on ball contract. So. That our, pre that, our pre thank you, that our previous financial advisor assisted us with a variety of things throughout the year. Uh, with our move now to Umball, Belvia Gray and her team will be taking care of that, so we needed to enter in to that new agreement. That has been attached to your uh, agenda for some time. And then the one that was attached last week, as you're well aware, uh, they have assisted us with a variety of uh, financial analyses uh, relative to general obligation bonds, uh, bond issuances, and things of that nature. And the second contract reflects those fee structures surrounding that one. So I'm asking approval of both of us this evening, please. I'll move to approve. Okay, move to approve for the conversation. Just one question, uh, more of a clarification. Just uh, I, I am assuming as part of this, you have or will notify our previous Bond Council and does it change? As we, we certainly know. will. I have had conversations with Lonnie Thurber. Lonnie served this corporation very, very well for decades and uh, is a great man and a terrific resource for us uh, with some of the issues that are coming about relative to general obligation bonds and, and um, uh, future bond issuances. Uh, his skill set uh, really um, I didn't feel like was best at this moment. But as soon as this is approved, we will notify Lonnie that he is aware of the conversation. Very good, thank you. It's been moved for approval. All those in favor signify by the sign of aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. City of Franklin and Franklin Community Schools IT Agreement, Mr. Sprout. 
Hello, I was, uh, I was able to answer the questions I provided last time. I was able to meet with a couple of board members and resolve any issues. Um, I'd be happy to answer any it. questions. Okay. <laughs> I'd be happy to answer any further questions or request approval of the contract. I'll move for approval. Let's go move for approval. Further conversation? Up hearing all those in favor signify by sign of aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Discussion items collaboration time project. Yes, we were uh, hoping to bring back the collaboration time uh, as uh, action item, but we've been meeting and through our process, we just finished gathering data from our stakeholders. We had over 940 people respond to surveys. I will tell you, Wednesday is the day that most people believe that we should, should have as, as far as collaboration time. It was split, a third and a third and a third in terms of AM, PM, or didn't care. Um, and okay. so uh, we then took that information and uh, we we're actually going through uh, an affinity project, a KJ project to come up with some common trends. This week we're gonna do a Pew matrix to, de to determine best for us. And one of the things looking at best for us, uh, we know we need a common consistent time. The question we're asking internally right now is, does that have to be the exact same time for K through 12? And it may not need to be that. Um, and so we're looking at that. In April, I'll have a full blown uh, review of the action to make process that we went through, but this is just so you're staying in the loop around it and what's happening. Very good, thank you. Elementary handbook. I'd like to thank Dr. Hyden for leading this charge. I see you guys every year. Um, really, we just need to open up the summary of changes and there are just two, I think, really. And they both relate to our wellness um, policy and our food services program. So where we do, don't have a written policy on bringing in um, store-bought or packaged party treats, um, we are incorporating one now just to give parents a little bit more guidance on that. And then the other changes that are highlighted there are just part of the food services program um, and, and how they operate and updated um, information on who to call and pricing. I would like to highlight the classroom party treats. Um, Mrs. Overton does a phenomenal job. And one of the things they're going to work with Chris next year is that, that they buy the treats from us uh, and we will get them to the classroom. That would include uh, health snacks that, they're, that meet the guideline as well as popsicles and things like that. So we're gonna really push that as a, as a way to be inclusive, but also control uh, what actually goes into the buildings. And that's been available uh, for us in the past, but we're really gonna try to step that up to make uh, a more uh, consistent journey for us. So to try to put some of the fun back in the, the fun sucking we are. mechanism that was put in place by our state and federal government. Did I say this out loud? I yeah, did. that's okay. You know, there was a day when we got to have cupcakes. <laughs> Thank you for having cake. Tonight. We had that cake tonight though. We completely <laughs> violated that rule tonight. I appreciate it. Sorry, yeah, I we'll digress. Bring, we'll bring the handbook back yeah. next month if you have any questions. I'm happy to answer or defer to our elementary principals. Thank you. Okay, moving on to uh, board administrative comments. Um, I'm getting, getting the, uh, the, the message for Mr. Sprout to come back up. And Mr. Ahouse as well. And Mr. Ahouse. I'm gonna go first. You're gonna go first? Just real quick. Um, Lily Grant 2.0 is due to the Lily Foundation on Thursday, so I just wanted to let you know that we have applied for that again. Excellent. And I do have a letter, Darren, I just need you to sign okay. as Vice President saying that you support the program. Absolutely. Okay. Got it. Mr. Sprout. 
provide a little update on the Google Summit that we'll be hosting next month uh, before our next board meeting. Uh, we are tra on track with the same amount of attendees that we had in years past, which is great news given that they've seen a decline in attendance in other venues. Uh, this year we're doing something different. Our middle school students, grades seven and eight, they're, uh, they're going to narrow that down to 100 students and they're going to be able to experience a Google day. And uh, so the speakers are going to come early, the keynote is gonna come early and actually present to our middle school students. Uh, Rita and Ben are working fervently on setting all that up. So it looks like it's gonna be another great year. Everything, all right. Mr. Rayhouse. Um, as far as the Google Summit, I don't know that there's a whole lot for me to, to add to that other than at the high school, they're, they're kind of taking over the <laughs> building with all kinds of, I mean, there's all <laughs> kinds of stuff that they're talking about doing and so those that have been have seen how at different times we've had a theme and we've uh, let that take over for the weekend and they're gonna do the same thing. And in this case, I think we're just talking about a lot of different options. So we're gonna look at that Friday before um, how we can get our kids involved and in kind of maybe experiencing some of the things that they bring in or uh, just seeing. I know um, we're still in those uh, meetings. So nothing really planned out yet, but it, I think we've got some fun things for our kids involved as well on that Friday before the, the summit gets going. So, uh, School safety is obviously a big uh, a conversation point for us throughout uh, the nation. Uh, would you just quickly highlight uh, what's happening at the high school? Uh, it also, if Mrs. Holman wants to come up, she's more than welcome, but um, what we're thinking of in terms of uh, March 14th, March 24th, and April 20th. Yeah, I think um, I could probably speak for Mrs. Holman unless she wants to come up here and talk as well. Um, but I think we're on the uh, we're we're all on the same page. I think on this, where um, we want to uh, take a very serious topic that touches us all, um, whether we are teachers and administrators in the buildings, or parents sending kids off to school, or students walking into the building, and we want them to be safe. And um, it's a topic of conversation among students and families and across the nation. So um, on the 14th, we wanna do the same thing. We wanna keep them safe. We, we want to make sure that um, inside of our walls is, is probably the safest place for them to be, but at the same time, we wanna give them the opportunity to express themselves and, and as well as uh, families. We've heard some, from some families as well that um, feel that the topic is very important and, and we wanna respect that. So we're just trying to find the best way to keep them safe and, and provide that same opportunity. So I think in both buildings, we're, we're doing that. We're giving students um, options, but at the same time, trying to keep it around school safety, try to keep them safe, talk about what's going on in our buildings, the best way for us to, you know, what are some of the things that we're um, doing or could be doing a little better, or, um, you know, just let kids even have an opportunity to just speak what's on their mind about school safety. And so um, that's really what it's going to be about on that day during that time period. I think in both buildings is just trying to, I know at the middle school they've got some events going on in the day and we do too, but I'm um, around that try to keep that, that focus during that time period on school safety and what we can do to be the safest place we can be. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Any board comment? No. Yep. I am happy to announce that the State Board of Accounts biannual audit is complete. Uh, Lisa Dungan and her team, consisting of Jake Coffey and a variety of others, spent about three months with us, likely the most efficient audit that we've had. I wanted to uh, give thanks in particular to the ladies who work in my office, Tammy Jackson, Cammie Hoffman, Carrie Hoffman, Melissa Kessel, uh, as well as Shao Moran on the Title I side, uh, Jill Overton, Paula Fleener and their staff on the food service side of life. Uh, there was one finding this time, and it was a finding from last time. As you may recall, our audit last time took a year, and by the time the audit was complete, we had made the alteration. It happened to be in prepaids in food service, but because the audit went so long, it actually bled into the next audit period, so they were required to include that. Um, so in effect, we did really well. And it's credit to all those ladies that I just mentioned who work really hard and do a great job every day. So it is complete, it's wrapped up, it'll be posted in the next uh, 45 days or so, and we'll forward that on to UMBAL for posting uh, which are the requirements of having an audit done. So um, we'll have another audit here in another year and a half. Thank you. 
Mr. Sprout. I wanted to follow up with uh, Steve's previous comments. Uh, our theme this year it, for the Google Summit is patriotism. And the National Guard is going to be fully engaged in this opportunity. So that weekend, uh, Franklin Community Schools is going to have a lot of National Guard equipment here. So just for the public and the board's sake, uh, not, nothing to fear. It's just a, an opportunity for us to honor those in service. Question, uh, how many uh, people are coming in for the summit? Approximately 500, a little over 500. And they're coming from all over the state, all over? All over the state and beyond. Um, uh, we, we pull from surrounding states, uh, Kentucky, Ohio, uh, Illinois, and Michigan. Is, is Mrs. Betts in the audience? Yes. So, um, question, and generic question. Not, not, you don't need to have a dialogue, just making sure that we're interacting with the city and they know that we've got folks coming in. Have a plan. Good, thank you. You're many, many steps ahead of me. Thank you. Any other comments? Moving on to calendar. Just quickly, uh, Hall of Fame nominations are due uh, this, at the end of this week, and then we'll be convening the committee and uh, making the announcement of the upcoming class um, in April or May. Um, spring break begins in a week on uh, next Thursday, the 22nd. Just a reminder to everyone that that is coming up. And also coming up, we'll have snow days. We have two of them still uh, to, to mark, the 27th of April and the 31st of May. Um, we heard a little bit about uh, 10X from Mrs. Bratcher's uh, committee and, and the, the, the excitement surrounding that. And support staff, uh, 10X grants are out and the deadline is right after spring break. So we'll look forward to announcing those winners. And then coffee with the superintendent on April 12th, we're gonna have uh, with me, uh, Mr. Sewell and Mr. Curley. We're going to be talking about uh, school safety and things that are happening in and around. Um, in addition, we are planning another uh, community engagement conversation around school safety with experts. Mr. Sewell is lining those up. Tentatively, the date is April 5, uh, and we'll, that'll be the week we come back from spring break. Same format as, as before. Uh, Mr. Sewell will serve as the moderator on panel discussion and uh, talk a little bit about bullying and safety are the topics for this year. Okay, last item on the agenda is public comments. Um, again, you may come up to the podium. None appearing. Move to adjourn. Thank you all, we are finished. <laughs>